coronavirus pandemic unfolds, we have all grown accustomed to the latest case and mortality counts as regular and unescapable features of programming. Though these figures are imperfect and likely underestimate the number of infected, even less understood is the number of individuals with COVID-19 who have suffered indirectly from disruptions in acute care and services to manage chronic disease. For the second installment of NCD Academy Panel's discussions of COVID-19, I'm pleased to be speaking with experts from around our region about these patients, the undocumented victims of COVID-19, and what steps we can take as healthcare providers to ensure their needs are not over. My name is Ibrahim Massarelli. I am a uh, past president of uh, Society of Cardiology State of Sao Paulo and currently a member of Science and Quality Committee of the American College of Cardiology. I will be your moderator, but before we get started, I'd like to ask to each of our panelists to, to introduce themselves. Let's start with you, Sheila. Okay, I'm Sheila Martins. I'm a stroke neurologist. Uh, I'm vice president of World Stroke Organization and incoming president uh, elected of World Stroke Organization and founder and president of Brazilian Stroke Network. Welcome. Now from Mexico, Adolfo, would you introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Um, nice meeting you. I'm Adolfo Chavez. I'm a cardiologist and a heart failure cardiologist. I am the chief of the clinical of the clinic of heart failure in my hospital, and um, I'm really glad being here. Thank you for being here, Alvaro. Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, Alvaro Vezun. I'm a cardiologist, and I'm the director of the International Research Center at the German Hospital Oswaldo Cruz in Brazil, and also professor at São Paulo University and a at large board member of the Road Heart Federation. And you're very welcome to this discussion. Bruno, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. First of all, I want to thank for this opportunity. I believe it's essential to involve people living with NCDs when discussing about matters that involve our lives. Uh, I'm a person living with both diabetes and depression. I'm current member of the Our Views, Our Voices, Uh, global advisory committee from NCD Alliance, and I'm, I'm also the young leader for the Brazilian Diabetes Society (SPD) uh, with uh, International Diabetes Federation. You just as well. Welcome. Now I have a whole list of questions for you all on the topic of the panel. But first, I want to be sure we do not leave out any general updates with regard to COVID-19 that are important to our viewers to know. So I have two questions, and uh, the first one is, is the group aware of any ongoing trials or recent publications out of our region that have shed light on potential therapies or the behavior of the novel coronavirus? I would start this one with Alvaro. Oh, this is a very good question indeed. So uh, Ibrahim, I need you to tell you uh, about Brazil and then uh, I could cover your question. So uh, in Brazil, we just started a very, very important and efficient organization named Coalition. And this coalition in, includes different researchers and different hospitals across the entire country. And we are evaluating currently 11 different questions. Three randomized clinical trials had finished, one of them published at the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. We have two other trials finished that the publication will come very soon. And we are still running key trials in Brazil to provide the answer, not only for Brazil, but for different countries in, in the world. So that, that's the, the, the important thing of Brazilian coalition for COVID-19. So join efforts to provide reliable answers to important questions uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemics. So that, that's the short answer regarding Brazil. But outside Brazil, we are learning from different trials, but maybe this is not the, the special place to discuss. We do have a lot of small trials, observational studies, and a lot of confusion in the field. But to be honest, we do have information that hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients should not be prescribed, and corticosteroids in very sick patients on ventilation should be used. So apart from that, we're still trying to find reliable evidence to drive our clinical press uh, uh, towards COVID-19 in the world. 
So we have to work together to beat a difficult enemy. Since we're talking about beating, to, uh, working together, let's move to Mexico now. Adolfo, do you have any information from any uh, ongoing trials in your region? We, as a cardiological hospital, um, we don't work directly with COVID-19 patients because we are still a cardiological hospital and we, we kept that way because we uh, need to keep on attending um, patients with uh, myocardial infarction. So we, we, we stayed as a cardiological hospital because the other cardiological hospitals became COVID-19 um, uh, hospitals. Uh, and in the meantime, we became the, the, the supportive uh, service for, for those hospitals. But still, we have been uh, uh, having patients with myocardial infarction, with AV block, with um, uh, in need of uh, pacemakers, etc., et with COVID-19 um, uh, uh, in the in, well in parallel. So um, because of this, Pfizer uh, approached and they asked for um, the collaboration because they wanted to prove or to try a drug as a multi multi uh, center trial and um, we we sent the papers and they they thought we were not the 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 proper hospital for the trial because we were not looking as much patients patients they wanted to to have so uh, but we know that Pfizer is doing something about the drug with uh, patients with uh, covid-19 but in the phase not very um, severe phase of the COVID. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll touch some very important points which you will have to address later on. But now let's have Chile thoughts. Do you know any, any ongoing trial or you're involved or you know what in Latin America that might contribute to fighting COVID-19? No, the information is the same that Alvaro told you. I don't know about any anyone, uh, any new trial. Okay. Bruno, do you have anything to add? Regarding new trials, I have nothing to add, doctor, but it's important to highlight that when, whenever the vaccine is out, it's important to take into, into consideration that people on developing countries need as much to access the vaccines as people living in the developed countries. So I think it's something important to keep in mind. That's very important. Now, what about the rest of the world? Let's begin with you now, Bruno. Do you know any ongoing trials from all of Latin America that are in you, particularly of COVID-19? Well, uh, if, you, if you allow me, when you, when you, sorry, when you said out of our region, by, mm -hmm. by, by mistake, I thought, well, out of uh, Latin America. But if you don't mind, <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, so let, let me just uh, go back just for two minutes and then I can provide the answer that you just asked. When I said the coalition Brazil uh, COVID-19, uh, the coalition one already published compared hydroxychloroquine versus uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin versus control in moderate infection. Coalition two, severe infection compare hydroxychloroquine plus, plus azithromycin versus hydroxychloroquine. The coalition three is in severe infection and arteries. So it's corticosteroid versus control. And I promise to, to be very fast. Coalition four is, uh, uh, is a host, for hospitalized patient with uh, COVID-19 positive and elevated D-dimer. So we are comparing rivaroxaban and heparin plus only the prophylaxis of anticoagulation. Coalition 5 is for uh, out-of-hospital patients. Uh, we are comparing hydroxychloroquine versus placebo in non-hospitalized patients. Coalition 6, we are uh, already finished, is an uh, IL-6 antagonist versus control in severe infection COVID-19. Coalition 8, we are comparing rivaroxaban versus control in out-of-hospital out patients. Coalition 9, is regarding um, a new agent, antiviral, antiviral versus control, and coalition 10 is an anti-inflammatory new drug versus placebo. Coalition 11 is, is the last one, 
is a new anticoagulant versus uh, plus, uh, versus control in out of hospital uh, patients. And finally, the coalition six, uh, f seven is the long term evolution of those patients. So this is the, the global picture of Brazil and all the 11 studies that you are running and maybe we can do more. So it's a very fruitful experience for all of us, the scientific community and of, of course, the researchers and all the hostels, and I should thank all the hostels and colleagues that contributed. And uh, your question regarding outside the region, uh, Ibrahim. So mm -hmm. these are uh, two trials, one with the Mount Sinai, that they are running a trial, the Mount Sinai with anticoagulants. The Population Health Research Institute at McMaster, they are running another trial with colchicine anticoagulants and the beta interferon. Um, the people from Oxford, they are running different trials, including out of patients evaluation of hydroxychloroquine. So there are several trials, but it's important to rely on reliable data from robust and solid and with the number, the sufficient number of events trial. Well, great. That was very, very extensive, very interesting. Wonderful. If uh, nobody has anything to add, I think we could move on to the theme of today's discussion. How COVID-19 has interfered with our normal work as healthcare providers and introduced a new, very serious barrier for patients who need uh, care for acute and chronic conditions that have been around since long before this pandemic. So now we have a few questions to ask to you all. And my first one is concerning acute care. It is important to distinguish between disruptions to acute care on one hand and to implant care to prevent and manage disease on the other hand, because they are so different functions of our medical systems. Looking first our Acute disease, hospitals have seen an alarming drop in patients admitted for myocardial infarction and acute heart failure, for example. Are those trends reversing? Do you think that's changing? Or are we still not seeing as many acute patients as we should see? I would start with Chile with this one because she also would have information on stroke, right? Yes. Well, uh, the number of patients with acute stroke arriving in the hospital decrease in the whole world in 40 percent in the first months of pandemic after a world awareness campaign about that uh, now we have 20 25 percent uh, decrease the number uh, of those patients so improve a little bit but it's still is too low number of patients arriving in the hospital it's the same in brazil we have a uh, um, 17 hospitals evaluated with the same situation, 40% decrease uh, the number of, our, of patients arriving and the patients are arriving late, more severe and more young with the stroke, with severe stroke. So, uh, uh, for example, we have usually 50, 10% uh, of patients with less than 50 years old with strokes. Now we have uh, 19%. So we increase the number of young patients with a stroke in, in Brazil. Wow, that's impressive. Bruno, do you yeah. see patients with diabetes a lot? Do you have seen any any changes in number of uh, diabetic patients with acute complications? Uh, so uh, I have heard a lot of cases of uh, people living with uh, diabetes uh, facing difficulties in accessing uh, healthcare during the pandemic, especially for like uh, normal uh, care, daily care, which would be like uh, uh, attend their uh, basic needs, which I have seen a few cases that develop to severe consequences of uh, diabetes, such as uh, ketocidosis, for instance. Adolf, you said you work in a cardiological institution in uh, in Mexico. Do you see uh, my patients going back, or are they still having their myocardial infarctions at home? Many of uh, the people we we have um, interviewed um, in the, during this time, they said that, uh, or they they are saying that they were afraid of arriving to the hospital. Even when they were having um, angina or when they had where they were having shortness of breath, um, 
the the good thing is that we have uh, we we have a, a chat or um, a WhatsApp for the patients we have already in follow in follow up for the clinic of heart failure clinic. So that's in that way we could we could uh, send SMS or, or WhatsApp in in case they were having dyspnea uh, uh, or any any other symptom that we could be that we were able to to recommend something um, in the meantime because they were afraid of coming to the hospital of because of coming of becoming um, diseased or or infected and yes we we were having. Uh, less patients, as as Dr. Sheila said, um, more or less like seventy percent less patients. Wow. Um, and wow. since 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 I every month I need to send a report of my number of of incomes, uh, not income but incoming patients. Um, I I I wrote the well a letter that said, saying that I have been having. 70% decrease in my uh, inpatients because of heart failure. And it was because of, of, uh, of um, different things, but mainly because of they were having, uh, well, they, they were afraid of coming to the hospital. And for sure they were having problems in, hosp in, in, their, in, their, in their houses. They were um, having more, more pain more more shortness of breath but they they won't be coming be un until this this ends but since this wasn't ending they started coming are they going back to the hospital now? a month ago so you have you have more pa more patients with them coming since, up at the the yes back. since a month ago is it's going up already we're having 80 percent uh, as the normal um, number Great. Alvaro, you have come a lot of data from Brazil. Do you share the same view? Are patients going back to hospital or are they still staying back home? Well, uh, I share the, the, the same comments of my colleagues because certainly the, there was a lot of data from Spain, from Italy, from US, New York, in California, showing that the admission had reduced of acute myocardial infarction. But we should be careful to interpret that because we are not saying that the incidence of my had been reduced. Because if, sure. you take, if you take into account that people uh, are not having physical activities, maybe the eating habit is not so healthy anymore, if stress and depression went up, so we have more risk factors for MI and stroke. So the, the logical uh, maybe thinking is that we are, in, we are having an increase of ACS and the stroke, but they are not showing up in the hospital because they are afraid to get infected. So I believe that this can be reversed, but not sure yet when this will happen. Because if you see, let's take into account our country. We, we are still having a lot of cases and uh, we are not feeling safe. We are vulnerable and mm -hmm. the, patient, the patients, they, they think the same extent. So even we, we keep saying to the patients in the news, please, if you have any symptom re related to a stroke or MI, please go to the hospital. Hospitals, they are well prepared. You are not going to get infected there, but they are afraid. Okay, let's, let's are. wait and see. Actually, uh, uh, I look up at Mexico now because I wish it were the same here in Sao Paulo. We're seeing a little bit increase in the curve of patients looking at hospitals, but we're not even close to the figures, to the nice figures you, you said. Yep. Um, yes, and maybe also because there were some uh, programmed, per, for, for instance, surgeries, and they were postponed because the, the the personnel also in the hospital were afraid of having contact with with patients uh, coming from outside with with COVID, and even uh, we were having troubles in uh, I mean technical problems in the surgeries because surgeons weren't be able weren't able to look into the microscopes because of the of the shield they were they were using, and uh, so so many things that changed because of this even the the, the surgeries the programmed surgeries 
were postponed. So the patients also didn't came because didn't 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 come because they they they, they didn't have any program um, of surgery or whatsoever. That's a very important point and brings me to an, our next question. Uh, has your institution modified acute care or how you would meet and treat patients with acute complications from other forms of chronic disease to protect against COVID-19? Adolfo, for example, said that your uh, institution is pretty much kept for uh, cardiac patients, right? While other sites were. So you did you have to undergo any major adaptation or it was just business as usual? Um, there are two main cardiological institutions in, in Mexico City, in, in the, the big city. It's uh, the, the, the one that we have, which is um, for uh, IMSS, Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, which is uh, one of the biggest. We have 70% of the, of the population in Mexico is, is within this, this institution. So we have a lot of, 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 of people. So it was not possible for us to close our hospital to become a COVID hospital because non-communicable diseases are still there and, and they were still uh, being the main problem. So we became the, the reference uh, for even other institutions, for instance, for um, Secretaria de Salud, which is the Ministry of Health, with, which has another um, a group of, of patients, very important, uh, but they were sending us patients. So we, yes, we, we needed to change uh, certain things. For instance, um, emergency room was divided between the suspicious patients with COVID and with the non-suspicious patients. So uh, we had um, a filter in the, in the entrance, and uh, all the people in the entrance were, with, were, were wearing masks and um, um, well, all the things. And they were asking about symptoms or fever or uh, having contact with uh, being in, con in contact with other people with COVID. And if they were having some uh, suspicious things, they were sent to the, to the, to the left side of the ER. Yeah. And if they were free of, of suspicious, they were sent to the right one. And even there, they were uh, because it was it, it, it's like every every um, other year, uh, every people, every person in the emergency room, they have um, an X-ray of the chest. So if they have any suspicious image, they were sent to the other side of the of the wall. Um, so it was for sure. It was uh, even that. I think it was uh, a little bit risky because if you have a patient with no symptoms at all, but with COVID, with the, which, which we already know that there there might be, you you would send it to the other side and the other way around. If you have another one with symptoms like flu-like symptoms and but not COVID, you 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 would send it to the COVID ones. So it was a little bit hard. And I applaud to my my emergency room um, team because they were really struggling in having uh, the best deci decision. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, ER people did. I mean, they were actual heroes in this war. Bruno, did you see any changes in the places where you work to adapt to treat acute patients and chronic patients with acute discompensation? Yeah, uh, I can share my my personal experience as I, I had COVID, and oh. when I yeah, so when I went to the to the hospital, uh, I just went normal procedures as like any other patient with COVID nineteen. So from my personal experience, I didn't see any different uh, treatment between those that had uh, previous chronic conditions and those who hadn't. Sheila? Well, yeah, we have a, a reorganization of hospitals to assist uh, patients with uh, new pathways for COVID patients or in no COVID patients and with areas for COVID patients and no COVID patients. Uh, in, our, uh, in our area in, in 
neuro uh, ICU and neuro critical care and stroke units in some hospitals were uh, modified to assist COVID patients. Uh, but most stroke centers in Brazil maintain their stroke units and stroke assistance. Uh, we don't have different hospitals to assist uh, stroke patients and other to COVID because the, the big hospitals in Brazil are assisting both. The big hospitals has a structure to assist COVID patients too, so we have to organize inside the hospital. Several hospitals create tents outside of the hospital for the screening the patient with uh, flu symptoms. Um, in some hospitals, we create a, a, a evaluation of PCR, a PCR for COVID in all stroke patients. And uh, we have a full personal professional equipment to assist the stroke code. We create a national guideline for this to or reorganize the hospitals to assist the stroke patients in this time with different uh, in the modified initial evaluation of these patients, but the treatments all patients are receiving with, when they need. And it was a very useful guideline, if I may add. Alvaro, would you have anything to add? Well, uh, I would maybe in, in, in a few minutes, in a few seconds, Abraham, um, Certainly, the, the tertiary hospitals, the excellence hospitals in Brazil, they really have a reorganization towards better treatment for COVID-19 patients and patients that need a different uh, assistance. But when you think about Brazil, we have a very heterogeneous country. We have a lot of public hospitals, and I do believe that we are doing well, but we don't have such data to tell you what we are doing as a country with 212 million people in all kinds of hospitals. I believe based on, of course, this is anecdotal, not talking to uh, different friends from different parts of the country. They really are reorganizing their hospitals and I believe that we are doing quite well. That, that's my perception. But from a hospital, I'm on the same page that Sheila. We reorganize. We have a GCI, uh, so we have the quote measure, metric is how to do it, but that's simple for tertiary private hospitals. Thanks a lot. But before we move, I just want to say, Bruno, we're all happy you're up and well and fine <laughs> back to work. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you all mentioned about changes we had to go, and I think that one of the most important one was uh, how we treat patients. COVID-19 has clinicians rushed prospect of delaying or modifying treatment for complex and severe disease that would normally involve inpatient care and regular face-to-face -face visits with the provider. For example, a greater use of oral therapies over chemotherapy with cancer patients. How have you seen this unfold in your particular field and what lessons are we learning from these adjustments to standards? Bruno, uh, let's begin with diabetic patients. Did you see many changes like that? What I saw, it was like a high positive uh, shift towards telemed. But we must recognize and acknowledge that, unfortunately, 30% of people living in Brazil don't have access to internet. So how to shift uh, physical face-to-face uh, -face interaction, face-to-face, uh, support to people living with uh, diabetes and any other like chronic conditions if they cannot access, uh, if they don't have access to internet. So this is a, a challenge and a question that I would like to, to bring. But regarding diabetes specifically, I think most of the, of the care and the treatment is totally doable through uh, telemed, but as I said, unfortunately, that doesn't apply for all the Brazilians. Oh, well, we work in a general hospital. Did you see any cha major changes happening? Well, um, I, I believe that the major impact on that, Ibrahim, is that we, we are living in a in acute condition, COVID-19, and our chronic problems, they are still there. So adherence, for example, post-MI, post-stroke, or hypertension treatment, we had already figures that are not so good. For example, uh, starting prescription or utilization, not prescription, post-stroke is about 10% in Latin America, 
Mm-hmm. And post MI it is uh, about 18%. Aspirin, 30% post MI and 25% post stroke. Hypertension control, roughly 15% of blood pressure control in hypertensive patients. So why would we expect to have a better control if before COVID-19, adherence was not so good? So my, my view is that adherence and the control of risk factors and diabetes treatment, blood pressure treatment, heart failure, I believe that you should evaluate those patients but my perception, my view, is that it is a little bit lower than before because of the pandemic. It's certainly, we have telemedicine, we can maybe uh, 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 adjust to this problem, but I don't believe that we are having good adherence for those patients. We're coming back to telemedicine in a second, but it oh. sounds to me that it's more like a bad thing than worse, more yeah. than anything else. Sheila, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. In a private hospital, I think it's a little uh, better. Uh, we have the patients are connected with us, but in the public hospitals, I think uh, they start too late to uh, to give opportunity for teleconsultation for these patients. What about you, Adolfo? How are things in Mexico? Did you have to change a lot of therapy? And uh, how are you using uh, any new to give us hope? Um, In my private practice, um, I think it's the same as Sheila and Alvaro said, and also Bruno, because um, most of the people, because that was the campaign here also in Mexico, stay at home, do not go out, which which I think it worked uh, very good for uh, at least two months. But um, since the people were, were struggling, even... Uh, to get uh, the, the drugs, uh, they were sending the, the, um, the son or the daughter to to buy them the drug. But um, there were there were I think they were struggling in some way to control their the drug pressure, even for the because also what what Alvaro I think he said they were uh, gaining weight because they were not yeah. uh, they were not uh, walking they were not uh, eating well. And they were um, uh, gaining not, not only weight, but also glucose. They were gaining uh, millimeters of mercury. And of course, they were worried about this. And uh, they were starting, they started to, to look for help. So since I think two months ago, I started to have um, more tele, teleconferences or teleconsultations. Which for me it was good because I was also charging uh, uh, for them, um, but it's not the same as as looking um, to each other in, in person and to 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 check if the blood pressure is uh, rightful um, uh, measured, because you 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 trust that they are measuring the blood pressure cor- properly, but you are not you're not certain. So that's that was also a difficulty in my private practice. In the hospital, it was very difficult for us because uh, since maybe you also have it, uh, the transplanting the transplantation program is is on pause because of this COVID, and um, the the people we were having already in the uh, latest phase in the D stage of the disease of the heart failure stage of the disease. We already were having the, 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 the project of, of transplanting them. They were all already on the list. And since COVID, it, it stopped. So we don't have right now a transplantation program. And the patients are uh, with, 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 with less resources. So we are trying to use as much as optimization of the treatment of the oral treatment as we can. But since you you you, you know um, there there are certain times where you cannot do anything else but to give them the surgery, you know. So yes, there have have been several changes in the management, um, in the oral management and the other uh, types of, of of management. Yeah. Now you all mentioned telemedicine. 
And I would start with Sheila asking, what do you think we still need to do to make telemedicine a useful uh, tool? I mean, from what I heard, it seems that it's good, it's better than nothing, but it's not perfect. <laughs> how would each of you give a suggestion on how to make it better? Beginning with you, well, Sheila. Well, uh, telemedicine for acute stroke is very good. We are using a lot and more now during the pandemic, we are using a lot to treat patients in several different parts of the country. Uh, we are using for uh, appointments, health appointments too, to contact patients with families because they are uh, isolated in the hospital or to contact doctors to doctors to don't put all doctors inside the ICU, for example, in COVID ICU. So we are using a lot. Uh, we have a problem with people without internet, without the facility for uh, to use telemedicine. We performed a survey in Brazil with uh, stroke survivors, 350 stroke survivors in different parts of the country, asking them about, about appointments, and 55% had the appointments cancelled, and only 18% 18, 18 have uh, access for telemedicine to discuss uh, with the problems with doctors or nurses or somebody to help him, to help them. So I think it's still a problem. We are improving a lot, but still we need to teach the patients how to use and we have to be available to them to, to give consultation. And what about the young generation? Bruno, you must be more used to this than uh, <laughs> great head people like myself are. So <laughs> <laughs> Would you have any suggestions on how making mm -hmm. telemedicine better? Uh, honestly, like in Brazil, as Dr. Sheila said, I believe that for uh, private facilities, that would be something that should be used. But for public facilities, at least on the short term, I don't have any like uh, a million dollar idea to suggest how address this problem. I, I would love to because I believe that could help a lot and uh, give access to people that usually couldn't go to a basic unit uh, facility. And so we could also improve the, uh, the adherence to, to the treatment. But at this time, I, ca I can't see how we could address this problem. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, since I was doing it uh, in my private practice, I um, looked at it as an opportunity to teach them to uh, control their own uh, disease. So I, I, um, well, I used a lot of time in the consultation to, on, on how to um, teach them Teach, teaching them on how to, to take the blood pressure, for instance, or to, um, to what what should they do if they feel something, or what should they, they do if they they have their blood glucose high, etc. Et so I think this should be uh, seen as an opportunity for us to teach more the patient, and in, in telemedicine, for instance, in, in blood pressure, uh, I think. Well, I don't know if in, in Brazil or in other countries, but in Mexico, most of the people uh, think that um, um, the, 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 um, uh, the automatic blood pressure systems, the, these uh, devices, are not as accurate as the mercury, uh, because I think that was a, a misconception since a really long time ago. And because these uh, devices are, are improving, uh, you can actually trust them more than the mercury systems or the the aneroid systems. So uh, I'm trying to change this mind full in my patients in order for them to trust their, their devices and to take them properly for uh, even for me to trust the, the, the device they are using. So they should have better um, quality of batteries. They should have uh, better quality of of of, of device. So oh. um, there, there there are some uh, not certified uh, devices that they should avoid. So I think we should look at look at as an opportunity for them also to have a continuous um, um, self management of their disease. 
and also by consulting us in case they are uh, needing it. But this is this is going to be forever. It's not only only going to be for uh, six months in advance. So I think we should uh, give some, um, maybe not a lecture, but maybe some tips about what should they be doing better for their for their own um, health. Right. We need to speak to our patients in a way they can understand what we're saying. Alvaro, well, would you have anything to share with us on this? Topic. Well, well uh, everything that get people connected is good for humankind. So uh, that that's a simple statement. The second statement uh, you bring is that to me this is a uh, let's do in a, in a Brazilian way. This is a broken bridge. We cannot we cannot step back anymore. So mm -hmm. we should assume that this come to stay. But of course, it, it needs some optimization of that. So I believe that the patient should have access, but access is just a half of the equation. The, the second half is to empowering patients because they needed to get used it, uh, with the system and also to feel comfortable. And the communication is key because when you have a face-to-face -face consultation, we can read the patient, not based on what they are telling us, but sometimes pre presentially it's more is easier to understand what's going on. But I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that patients should be empowered, and by uh, assuming that the years, I believe it's going to be higher, and also lifestyle counseling should be even better than before. And the next step, I, I am I'm just dreaming with that. Uh, I cannot do auscultation. Of course, I can speak to my patient. Uh, they take blood pressure, uh, I, as Adolf said, and I asked about the blood pressure in that particular day and heart rate. But auscultation, definitely very soon, the mobile will have this capability. And I could be able to hear their lungs and heart. So I believe that it comes to stay longer and longer. Yeah, wearables may also play a role. If you have a vest that can access the heart and send information, but it's got to be cheap, it's got to be accessible to everybody, and uh, it's got to make life better. <laughs> but, you, know, you know, Ibra, only the abdomen, I'm just maybe talking different from the, the script, but the, regarding the abdomen exam, yep. it's hard to see what yeah. kind of medicine can help us. This is the only <laughs> trick limitation that I, as a doctor, I have the limitation, the palpation. How can you? <laughs> Only yeah. to have this wearable vest with ultrasound that can <laughs> send it to you right away. Yeah. <laughs> so, might be the one million dollar idea that Bruno just mentioned. <laughs> now, back to people. The pandemic has introduced a whole loss of a whole host of stressors and on our well-being. You all mentioned that. And reductions and modifications in healthcare services are only compounded by the financial strains of being out of work and the physical and psychological consequences of a more sedentary <laughs> lifestyle. Could you speak to some of the bigger picture issues outside of the control of the individual clinician or health system that are eroding health outcomes and need to be a greater priority for policy and public health experts? I will really hold you last for this one because I know you have a lot of thoughts on different risk factors and different things. So let's just start with Bruno now. Uh, uh, it's interesting that I was just like writing a piece today about the, the effect and how the alcohol industry improved their marketing strategies during the pandemic. We, we have seen a lot of lives and like uh, virtual concerts on social media being sponsored by uh, big uh, alcohol industry, especially like beer industry. So uh, unfortunately, I see on the mid and long term that uh, the uh, rates of alcoholism will increase and especially and also the rates of uh, people who are not uh, exercising enough. So I believe that all the risk factors that we had prior to the pandemic will, unfortunately, 
definitely increase and will become like uh if it wasn't uh addressed before as a major uh problem a public health problem uh, definitely from now on should be sheila do you agree yeah yeah i agree i think the alcohol is a problem during the pandemic but uh, the food is a problem too i think uh, uh, the people is increasing uh, uh obesity uh, increasing the uh, the unhealthy food consume so and decreasing the exercise so i think is a huge problem and you have to stimulate them to exercise inside home and uh, uh, to consume uh, uh, healthy food decrease salt decrease uh, is not easy but uh, is a challenge now but i think is a huge problem for us I heard that uh, in Brazil the problem is even bigger with children. Children are eating more and more junk food than they were before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But those, what about you? Mm, I heard also about uh, some psychological effects about this. Uh, you were saying, uh, Dr. Pinto. And um, for instance, I, I think uh, even even. Uh, not not only in the in the outside, but also uh, for us, for the health system, um, there there has been lots of of um, uh, discrimination for the uh, medical staff and nurses and uh, and lots of people re regarding this COVID mm -hmm. um, COVID thing. So in, in my experience, I I am having with the neighbors some discrimination. So before this. They uh, they approached and then talked and whatever they they asked my children to go outside and play with with their children, and right now they are not wanting to uh, to 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 come near my house, and 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 not even with my children. So, I think it's uh, uh, that's not a big thing, but for other people, uh, there there had been. Um, even uh, uh, strikes and 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 things because they don't want to have um, uh, as a medical staff or, or or a nurse near their their place of work, which is a little bit um, awkward. And I don't know I don't know what to say about this. That's a psychological side effect, a very bad side effect of of this pandemic for us in the in the health system because you were you would. You would think the other way around. You would think that they they would be um, grateful, and and you you see that they somehow they well, they say they are grateful, but they're not really. They are afraid of you because you can be the the vector or the 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 one who brings the disease to the to the neighborhood. Yeah, and and that's yeah. a, a difficult issue. I don't know if, if in their countries, in your countries, are having the same thing, but here in Mexico, it's being a little bit difficult. Alvaro, would you answer to that? And uh, by the way, would you mind sharing some of the thoughts on uh, stress and impact of stress and how to handle that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let's see. So, so providing Ibrahim and colleagues provide some figures. Uh, we do have a very solid data from the Interheart, is International Case Control Study, and the stress and depression played a major role in the association with MI and also stroke. But when you see the stress in the world, the population attributable risk was 32%. When we see in Brazil, goes up to 44. So stress is equally important in the world, but if you see controlling stress in Brazil, we can avoid more MI than in other countries because stress play a major role. For strokes, the same. And also, Sheila, it is interesting because the alcohol intake in excess, we need to have another debate to discuss what is excess, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but alcohol in excess increases the chance of stroke too. So we, we have a problem during the COVID uh, pandemics because it's, well, it's hard to say, but it looks like that the stress went up and depression uh, went up too. So maybe we needed to rethink the way of evaluating outcomes because we are good in terms of survival or reduction in MI, stroke, 
and there is outcome research that combine hardening points plus cost and quality of life. But maybe, perhaps, possibly, we need to enlarge the way of seeing benefits in cardiovascular medicine. And when I say enlarger the benefit, there are, there are some uh, topics related to spirituality. It's not about religion, it's about spirituality. The way that we cope with adverse effects in our lives can be good for us or can be bad for us. And the pandemic is there. We cannot change outside of us. We cannot change that. We, we need to live in the best possible way in that situation. So maybe it's time to try to uh, understand what kind of uh, let coping activity could do could provide more health or could provide more disease to us. And finally, Ibrahim, I believe that we are in the in the momentum in the society, globally speaking. We are living in a changing society, and the paradigm to understand how we get sick and how we can control our disease can be reshaped with new ways of investigating why and how we get sick. So we have maybe a, a very good opportunity to try to understand all the factors and not only the usual ones. That's a very good answer. And Adolfo, in Brazil, what I saw many times is kind of two opposite behaviors. Some people were, just like you said, afraid of everybody else, trying to keep away and isolating themselves. But some people, the masses didn't come across, so uh, they were living as if there was no danger. And they were going yeah. to bars, they were <laughs> drinking yeah. and socializing as if yeah. they were before. So, yeah. and that brings me to other reasoning that uh, it, we've got to learn. This is a new situation that stressed us to a point we've never been stressed before, and we've got to learn how to cope with these new things and this new situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's a challenge. Speaking of challenging, and now many corners of the medical community are predicting a surge in patients with advanced chronic disease after months of patients being hesitant or unable to seek care while spending less time being active. We all talked about that. What are health systems in your country doing or what should they be doing to prepare for this potential influx in critically ill patients? That's, uh, that has the potential to be a big problem. I and mean, maybe yeah. we're not going to be ready to admit all the people that will come back. Adolfo said that he's seen like 70% of patients going back, I mean, compared to what he had before. But you all Brazilians said that that's not our experience here. So we're kind of worried about what will be of public health systems when the oldest people go back to hospital. Since he's in a better position, I will start with Adolfo and then I'll move to the Brazilian <laughs> side of the board. Adolfo? <laughs> I really don't know. I think uh, we will have to adapt. I think we'll, we will have to, um, um, I don't know, look into um, the, the difficulties in the moment and try to to um, address them as well as uh, as we can because i don't think well as as i know right now in the in the, in the moment i don't know that the 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 authorities are having a project or a program for this um, coming back to the normal life we have already a semi-normal pro program in, in our hospital and it's about getting started with the COVID-19 uh, as a comorbidity, because we, we are still having the risk of having a, a COVID post positive patient with a myocardial infarction, and they are increasing. For So if we have more numbers, we have more possibility of having a COVID uh, in the meantime. So we, we are still using the masks, we are still using the, the face shields, we're using all the protection we can, but still we can get infected. I, I got infected one month ago. I was I was I was ill and I recovered and I got back to the to the hospital and I'm working as as before. So we have the, the chance of getting it and uh, we need to 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 make the best decisions to try not to get it. But 
it's not going to be easy, I think. Well, I have to say, we're all happy to see you two up and well and back in business. <laughs> Sheila, what do you think? Yeah, too. Well, I think uh, in public hospitals, we are not prepared for this. Uh, I think uh, is a huge problem. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, critically uh, ill patients, we have a huge problem in our country. But uh, a good uh, a good thing is that now we have more beds in intensive care unit, more beds in hospitals that can be used to assist these patients. So the pandemic increased the number of beds in different uh, parts of Brazil. So. Uh, maybe this can uh, can be used and can support the the problem of patients critically uh, ill uh, after this first phase of the pandemic. But I, I'm I'm worried because I think the public hospitals are not prepared. Bruno, do you agree? I agree, and also I would say that uh, fortunately we cannot change the damage that has already been made but somehow the harmful products industry should be taken accountable and they should be uh, i would say charged in order that all the uh, harmful and negative impact they cause uh, in the lives of millions of brazilians that that money should be used in order to improve our public health system. So I wouldn't say that for the damage that has already been made, we could do something in order of prevention, but in order of prevention of like new cases and new more people, unfortunately, uh, uh, harmful impacted by all those products, we should do something in order to address that. Thank you. Alvaro? Well, uh, I, I'm going to use the same sentence that uh, Sheila used. We are not prepared. But let, let's just think it globally. Uh, Europe was not prepared as well. They, yeah. faced, they faced a real problem. Yeah. Italy, for example. So yeah. there, no country was, well, New York, if you see the New York, uh, New York City, where was not prepared. And if you see Brazil, we have 10 times as high cases in comparison to some European countries, of course, except Russia. So we are not prepared. But on the other hand, uh, for critically ill patients in comparison to Europe, for example, we are facing maybe critical challenges in comparison to them. Definitely, we're not prepared, but this is a universal problem during the COVID-19. Okay, so uh, it's not just about Latin America. And second point is regarding our system. I am, I am, in fact, I'm an enthusiast of our system. We have the universal health coverage. So three quarters of the Brazilian population rely on that coverage, at least three quarters. Of course, there are room for improvement. It could be optimized. I know that. But this is a very good system. We have, we have 212 million people. It's quite easy to someone says, oh, we have a perfect system. How about your population? 5 million people, 10 million people. So it's quite hard to organize in more than 100 million or 200 million like us. So we, we are not prepared, but we are doing, I would say, quite well. And there is some adaptation and the system, I believe that is supporting, but we need more help. Definitely, we need more improvement on that. But it's not about Brazil, Latin America, it's about the world. Yeah, we've got to learn. That's one thing that this pandemic taught us is be ready, be prepared for the unexpected. <laughs> uh, may always be surprised. Uh, well, we're now uh, coming to the final moments of our discussion, I would like to ask each of you to just give a final message, a take home message. So let's begin with Sheila now. Well, uh, I think uh, is unacceptable that uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we increase the number of people dis disabled caused by treatable and preventable disease as a stroke and myocardial infarction. So the pandemic will pass 
but the sequels of this disease are for the for the whole life. So uh, please, if you have symptoms of stroke or chest pain, don't stay at home. Great, thank you very much for being here with us. Bruno? I'd like to highlight that, as Dr. Adolfo said, the uh, psychological and the mental impact of the of the pandemic unfortunately will continue and we should address people and we should uh, care of people living with chronic conditions not just from their uh, first and original disease but also we should look them with like as a person and not as a patient and treat them holistic and that includes looking into the mental uh, health Adolfo, thank you very much, Bruno Adolfo. Um, as uh, Dr. Sheila said, um, for sure, if you have chest pain, dyspnea, um, syncope, do not hesitate and go to the emergency room. We are still working as as as, as usual, but still, I would see or I would send an, uh, a message to the health personal uh, because we are afraid for sure because we do not know if we are going to be um, with a with a, a mild uh, disease or we're going to have the severe form of the disease so we are going to be afraid in any case but still we need to learn from this we need to work with this because it's going to be and as uh, dr alvaro uh, said is going to stay here with us uh, for a long time, even with the vaccine, we have to to have uh, uh, protection. We will have to have certain um, uh, well um, improvement improvement in our decisions in order for us to be safe, not only for COVID but also with other diseases. Because we, uh, I think, we uh, underestimate other other diseases. For instance, we had H1N9 uh, uh, 10 years ago in uh, 2009, and it was also a big problem for us in Mexico. We learned from that, even when you were out for uh, eating tacos in the street, the people there, they were having uh, alcohol, uh, gel, alcohol gel for, for your hands. Uh, so you were having, um, uh, even with this, but washed hands for, for you to, to, to eat a taco. So, and we, we decreased, uh, since the time was passing, we decreased this, this uh, improvement, I would say, in, in our precautions. And then we have another one. And now we're restarting the, the process of, again, uh, washing our hands, using the gel. And so we are seeing again, uh, gel everywhere, as we saw in 2009, and we need to uh, learn from this and keep on doing this, even with the vaccine, because what we are afraid of is that we, when we have the vaccine, and because I already have it, uh, we we put the, the shields down and we don't take care of us anymore, and we are seeing uh, people reinfecting them or, or being reinfected, and and we are not going to uh, we, we we don't know what is going to to happen with these people so um well the 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 message is uh, we have to learn we have to work with this thank you very much yeah i heard it some time ago that it's the doom of man that he forgets so we should keep <laughs> remembering these hard times we are going through right now alvaro your final thoughts hello uh um the first one is that we should perform good quality research and find new treatments. So this is key for researchers. Uh, secondly, uh, only proven therapies should be implemented, either for prevention or for treatment. So this is a, a very simple message. Uh, the third one, uh, if you see the recent figures in Brazil, uh, we got 3.8 million infected cases. 119 deaths already. And it, as Adolf said, we don't know for how long this pandemic will stay. 
and it could vary across countries. And maybe you need to live with that, maybe for a few years, we don't know. So if you don't know about that, I believe that this is the first time for the humankind that we really have a common problem. If you see the Second Great War, despite of being called a world war, this is limited to our region in the world. But this one, this one is a real world problem, a real world challenge. So this is a problem for all of us. If this is a problem or challenge for all of us, it looks like that the solution should be collective. So uh, maybe uh, I'm a little bit romantic at the end, Ibrahim. And I, <laughs> I, would, I would say this is an invitation to think differently than before. Yeah. And maybe uh, a society with a more solidarity should be needed for the next years. So why I'm saying that? Because we are living in a common problem. We should find a better way to live and live together. So maybe this is a very good opportunity for improving the world. But let's wait and see. Thank you for the opportunity. That was great. And I think you're right. I mean, all the things we did before brought us to where we are. So we need to do things yeah. differently from now on. Perhaps invest more on education, on empowering yeah. things, or changing things. But I want to thank you all very much for all your thoughts and everything you brought to sh and shared with us. And thank you for all those who took time out of your days to join us in this important conversation. I hope our viewers will be on, to, on the lookout of the third and final installment of these regional discussions later this year. Uh, the NCD Alliance will be moderating our final panel on how not to simply sustain standard services for NCD patients, but to act on more ambitious policy frameworks for closing long-standing gaps in NCD outcomes worldwide. Thank you. See you then. Okay.